Public programming has always been an essential part of what we do at Ilham. With the MCO in place, we are now programming remotely under our new project, Ilham at Home. Our first program is a conversation with Chitu, one of the artists featured in our most recent exhibition, The Body Politic and the Body, in collaboration with Singapore Art Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for our first ever Ilham conversation. Um, under a series, Oham at Home. Thank um, you for having me. Oh, no worries. You're currently exhibiting at Oham Gallery with the uh, Singapore Art Museum under the exhibition titled The Body, Politic and the Body. Could you please describe the works behind you and what prompted you to create them? This work came from, from a desire to want to document and make a timeline of civil disobedience in Malaysia. Um, when I mean Malaysia, I mean Peninsula Malaysia, Borneo, and Singapore, as it was a part of us back then. A timeline going back to like the 1800s, basically the earliest documentation I can find about any form of civil disobedience. Um, but I came from a desire of, of that, and that's one, and also a desire to work with bitumen. Well, why is there a desire to work with bitumen? I feel like a lot of my practice is about experimenting with medium and technique and exploring mediums. Um, Cause you know, being self-taught, you know, sort of a bit of an outsider artist, I feel like you try everything else. And because I can't pin and draw, mm, W work have to just try and do more. So of course, you know, being an artist in Malaysia, you kind, I kind of feel like I need to legitimize my practice by being a painter. <laughs> so here I am painting. And of course, to legitimize my practice as a Malaysian artist who paints, um, I would have to paint with bitumen. So for each of the works behind you from, I guess, my left to right, I'm just gonna, going to give them titles for the mm -hmm. audience. Um, so the one in the far left is called 13th of May, 1969. Mm -hmm. uh, the middle one is Ref Marcy, and the one on your, on my right, is per se 2.0. That one, and yeah. Tentative working titles, so they can change at any time. They're tentative working titles because, I mean, this is really a work in progress. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I can't even say it's a work in progress because I barely started. Um, I've only made three pieces. I, I plan to make like 50 of them. Um, simply yeah, wow. because so much has happened. I, I mean, each piece is supposed to commemorate an event. If, if there's a message, I, I think um, the message is in the title, which is, you know, this whole, this whole talk of oh, like protest bukan budaya kita and all that kind of things. Um, well, I guess the message is, it is, our, it is our budaya. It is, I mean, like, there's been thousands of incidents, thousands of incidents, you know, dating back 200 years um, of yeah. protests. I mean, even the people that say that protest is not our culture, Buka Budaya Kita, started yeah. their political party with a ton of protests. <laughs> These three events are significant in Malaysian history, right? And you've chosen to work with them, no, even though they're not necessarily from the, the earliest point yeah. in Malaysian history. Yeah. They're still relevant. Today. Yeah. So, so the, the three... These are three of six key events. Um, identify six key periods in, in, in this timeline. The first being, like I mentioned, the earliest one in 1853, when Rentap attacked um, the fort in Sri Aman. Um, that's, that's that era in, in, in the 1800s where, where the local population and indigenous populations were rising up against um, British colonial powers. Um, and, and these are usually violent uprisings involving armies of, of native warriors attacking bases and police stations and things like that. And then of course, there's 1920s, um, which, is, which is the rise of sort of the socialist movement. So there's a lot of, like, at that time, there's a lot of things like labor strikes involving rubber estates, mines and things like that. And then in the post-war period, 45, 48, that kind of time was Malayan Union, 
Ultra AM, CJA, the, the fight for independence of the nation. And of course, then the fourth key event, which is this one. Wait. This one here. <laughs> um, it's um, May 13, 1969. I don't think we need more explanation on May 13, but, but that's when I sort of feel that it was an event that sort of changed the course of the nation, mm -hmm. where, where race politics sort of took center stage from then on in the country. Yeah. And of course, then there's Reformacy 1998, where um, opposition politics, you know, sort of took the lead in civil disobedience, and protests and demonstrations and of course 2010 if i'm not mistaken 2010 when birthday two happened which was when civil societies and common everyday people took over that that space what was the process of making this art work you know first i have to identify the sites that i want to work in mm -hmm. um, i mean the sites i want to trace actually so so what i have is i i have this like big two by two meter piece of tracing paper, um, okay. which I lay on top of the exact spot that I want to trace. And of course I do this with a couple of people, you know, between 12 and 3 a.m. Um, we <laughs> pretend like we're road construction workers. We set up cones and like, like you know, like hazard lights and wow. shit. We dress up you in- You have the uniform? We dress up in like, we dress up in like, um, those reflective vests and all have those like wow. black stained blondes and all. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I was wondering how you managed to like trace yeah. over yeah. Yeah, roads. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a bunch day. of like, I have two more guys helping me out with this. And they're just yeah. like, directing traffic and shit and making sure I don't get hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's that, you know, like we will be tracing the roads. I mean, I, I just lay it down, trace the roads and I, and I bring it back to my little studio. Um, where I've already painted this big ass piece of canvas with bitumen and I just transfer those lines on it and then paint it with road lines, with road paint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the black is what you see is the bitumen, right? And yeah, so the, the black is the bitumen. Yeah. yeah. And you made it so that the yellow street sign, were they faded in that instance? Like the May 13th one, was that a faded road? Um, it's not faded. faded actually, it's not that faded. Okay. I like how I'm like looking at the work, like, oh, it's, it's not yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that, but <laughs> it's not really it's it's not, that. <laughs> it's not faded. I mean, um, I didn't intend for it to fade, but I think that's just how the paint, and that's just also how the paint sort of reacts to aging, I guess. So, um, I made this piece quite a while ago, I made this piece like a year ago. Oh, wow. A year plus ago, actually, um, for another exhibition, and I added these two more pieces for this show. So yeah, no, it's it's just the nature of the paint, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I thought that was you marking the chronology of events, you know, and no, time no. passing. Okay. No. no. <laughs> well, that's cool that it worked out that way. Anyway. <laughs> yep. As you said earlier, you chose um, Bisman as a yeah. medium to represent these events. Right. So why didn't you choose, let's say, a more popular medium to catalog stuff, which is photography or video? The reason why I've, I've done this is because um, my, my practice actually works in a way where there's two columns. The first column is things that I want to do. And the second column is things that I want to talk about. And, and strangely, on the things I want to do column, I want to trace road lines and paint them with bitumen on canvas. Um, because, you know, roads are paved with bitumen. Why I have that desire to want to do that, um, there's a sinister reason I can't talk about now. <laughs> on, but, and then on the column of what things I want to talk about would be protest and civil disobedience. So what I always do is that I've, I, I have these two columns and I try to match things. And... I sort of match these two things together because, you know, protest demonstrations mostly happens on the streets, even if it's in the jungle, but, you know, like it, it would be on a logging road. It's a dirt road, but you know, it's, it's some sort of a street simply because I, I think we, the whole point of a protest is, is to sort of disrupt and, and being on the street is probably the mother of all disruptions. So this project came about that way. 
linking of these two ideas. So would you then categorize your art uh, as process art? Would that be an accurate description? Well, kind of is a bit of a protest art, I guess. Uh, I would say it's kind of protest art on a few levels because it is about protest one. And, mm -hmm. and, and two, I think it's, it's a bit of a pers personal protest art for me because I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm so called, I see myself as making historical paintings. And in a yeah. way, it's a bit of a protest. Um, of that technical. Yeah, it's a bit of like a technical protest in yeah. that sense because, you know, um, historical paintings are usually this like big sort of a salon type paintings of like oil paintings where things are with immaculate detail and realism. Um, but, yeah. but I also realized that I can't paint for Okay, well, <laughs> that's very honest. <laughs> so, I mean, I, mean like, I really can't, I, I can't paint, I can't draw. In a sense, I'm, I'm doing whatever I can based on the limitations yeah. of my bit, of my of my skills and abilities. And this is really all I can do. Um, I guess in a way it's a protest because it's my way of being pick headed in wanting to sort of carve space and, and be a painter in that sense. Like, oh, like I, I want to paint, so I'm, I'm painting this way. Yeah. yeah. And you're painting in a more commercially accepted, you know, like not even high art form of painting. Yeah. Where you're using <laughs> materials that aren't really seen in galleries you know and yeah. you're using like big rollers and even coming to terms with that that you may not be technically like on the same level as some <laughs> historical grand historical painter kind yeah. of inspires yeah. generations of people who want to do art but they're always like oh i'm not good at drawing and you know but art is more than that so that's yeah. really awesome yeah um, yeah, yeah. I, I think and, my, i think my realization where i can make art was 10 years ago when I was at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And I saw one of Saul Lewis' wall drawings. And, wow. and I was like, hmm, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back to Malaysia and I started making art and, and just conned my way through. That's great advice for aspiring artists. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've said that people often categorize your activities in the street as art, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what <laughs> relationship do you have with the street now that we've seen the street being taken into a gallery as opposed to bringing the art? Yeah, the it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a full circle thing in that sense because back in the days when I was younger and had a lot more energy, <laughs> I, I used to really like engaging the public on the streets. I mean, not the street streets per se, but in public. Um, um, there were things like Manuel Raya, which happened every month at Atara Mudeka, where we played like, you know, schoolyard games. Um, then there's things like Everything's Will Be Alright, which is like this sort of monthly, for a few months, monthly performance art thing where I invited different artists to do different things um, in Bukit Bintang. And, you know, there was this desire of, of bringing art to the streets. And, and I feel like with this um, project, I went full circle a bit, like now I'm bringing the streets into the gallery, I think. What are your experiences with these protests then? My first protest, proper protest, I think is 2003, um, during the Iraq war. And that was a protest that I went to, I was 22 years old at that time. Um, first protest in front of the American Embassy on Jalan Tun Raza. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that kind of changed my life a bit. Um, of course, from there, I, I met a bunch of activists, anarchists, um, punks, you know, the protest types. And I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a punk or an anarchist in that sense, but, um, but hanging out with them and, and hanging out with the activists sort of changes the way you look at things. And then after that, there was this group that was a part of called Carter Gender, which is a collective of, a collective of artists and activists um, that came together as a result of the Sisters in Islam workshop, um, where we did a lot of street performance protest type things. Yeah, of course, and then there was 
2007-2008 when Vase Hindra the whole world started blowing up mm-hmm. and getting arrested once or twice so also I think you know like is a part of my life that I that I would like to look on, look at so that I can make sense of what I've experienced also mm-hmm. yeah hence this series of works I think you realize how much power citizens had when they take to the straight streets right and disrupt yeah. society in that way yeah um i, I had that realization first at the first birthday um mm-hmm. actually that was i mean prior to that you know you go to protest as like and that's a thousand people usually that's like 30 people 50 people 100 people in the mm-hmm. lunch you know, you feel like, okay, like you're just making noise on the sidelines. And then, uh, yeah, I remember this thing too, on the first bus day, we were walking to Jalan Istana. And I, and I looked back, and I realized all of Jalan Istana was just full of people. Like, it was just like, completely blocked up. Like, like it's as far as the eyes can see. And like, this is, this is really, really amazing. I mean, like, this, I've never seen so many people at protest before. And, and then you realize what happened that day, you know, like, the cops went all out, trying to stop people from in the city. Like, yeah, like there were roadblocks everywhere. People were stopped from coming to the city. There was so much effort being put in place to stop this from happening. And here we are, still blocking traffic and causing so much disruption. And and I realized, wow, like, like this is this is really happening. Like we are we are really disrupting something here. People can't turn to any digital platforms to create the same. Yeah you know, to voice their opinions. Yeah, and if yeah. they do, it's not exactly the most powerful. I don't know. Um, I, I, I can't comment on that because I've, way before we were social distancing, I've been social media distancing for like a long time now. I, I kind of am not really on social media anymore, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't comment on the power of social media now because I'm, I yeah. don't understand social media anymore. Yeah. And we've seen it being manipulated throughout some elections and... Yeah, you know. I also feel like just reading more news on, on how on how governments are manipulating social media um, yeah. in reaching audiences. Like, I feel like you, 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 you can't really... You can't really win anything on social media, isn't it? Like, like yeah. There's always some PR agency that's there to, to really, really work the big data to make sure yeah. that, you know, the right message is sent to the right people. Mm-hmm. Um, and websites like uh, Change.org, you know, have these petitions, yeah, but they're not as... Yeah, that's in Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah, okay. because, you know... Yeah, I mean, like, Change.org makes sense in the States. Because they've kind of legislated, like, if you reach this much, many signatures in the petition, the White House must answer. Um, we don't have that kind of legislation in Malaysia. I don't know how much petitions can do in Malaysia, to be honest. Um, yeah. Also because I feel like there's so many nonsense petitions around that yeah. that you, you don't know which one to take seriously. Like, I saw a petition yesterday. I almost died. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, I really almost died. I, I saw a petition asking for the health DG, the health director general to be made the Minister of Health, which I'm like, are you kidding me? Because um, why, <laughs> well, yeah. why turn a why turn a really effective and you know one of our best public servants into a politician? <laughs> Leave the government servants alone. They're doing a great job running the country. We don't need them to become politicians. Yeah, so you have you have nonsense like that floating around. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 one of the things that, one of the reasons why I, leave, I left social media was I felt that as much as yes, it's great that it's empowering people to do, you know, it gives people voice, a voice for things that they want to say. I feel like also it sort of makes everyone think like their voice is important. Mm-hmm. Suddenly everyone has a voice. And that's particularly apparent in Twitter. Right. Oh, so my, my God, like Twitter, Twitter is like it's like the most toxic place on the internet. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't do Twitter anymore. Yeah, every everyone <laughs> thinks that they have an opinion and they're like and they have like this amazing opinion 
important thing to say when I don't know. I I I I, I don't want to comment any further because you know it's not yeah. my scene. I, I'm not a part of it. <laughs> I don't engage it. It's not fair for me to comment on it. Yeah. Okay. But, but yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, I see. Um, can you recall a time where you have like voiced opinions, and it's kind of led to some change? Like ten years ago, when I, when I sort of had a little protest with the LRT. Um, mm. Rapid like, KL. Rapid KL. <laughs> yeah, Rapid KL LRT. Um, because because back then, ten years ago, before before it was on, it was even hit to ride a bicycle. I I kind of had this foldable bicycle that I ride to the train stations, fold up, put in the train, get off and put it back on again and ride to my destination. Uh, this is like in 2008 or 2009, 2008, yeah. And I did that for like a year and, and suddenly like I got to the train station and the, and the person at the counter told me, no, you can't do this. You can't bring a train, you're bike into the station. I'm like, what? I've been doing this for a year. Um, which they were like, no, no, you can't. I'm like, no bicycles. I'm like, mm, okay. And I was like, okay, nonsense. Um, so I, I rode to the next station where I was supposed to change trains, which is in Masi Jami, hoping I can get into the train there um, yeah. for my ride with DJ. And again, like, no, 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 like, oh, no bikes allowed. I'm like, what? And I'm like, okay, this is nonsense. So <laughs> I went and find myself a piece of cardboard, like a little piece of cardboard. I had a Sharpie in my bag and I, I wrote something on it. I can't remember what I wrote on it. And I took my bike folded and I sat in front of the turnstiles with my bike with holding the sign. That's like a, some sort of protest. I can't remember what I was protest. I can't remember what I was, was saying. Um, it's basically like, why can't I get on the train with my bike? Um, but of course, 15 or 30 minutes later, these two guys came, picked me up, manhandled me and dragged me out of the station and just threw me and my bike out. Um, which I was like, okay, I'm going to go lodge a police report now for assault. Yeah. And and after that, I sort of like, I contacted Rapid KL and I wrote to the press. There were like press interviews. There were Rapid KL rebuttals saying that, oh, I was being an ass. And I was like, oh, Rapid KL being an ass. And there was this back and forth PR war with Rapid KL. And of course, I became persona non grata with Rapid KL then because I remember going to the station, buying a ticket, and I can see this, this picture of me and my bike. <laughs> In the counter, like a, wow. like a warning, don't let this guy in the <laughs> They tried to blacklist you. Yeah, they tried to blacklist me. <laughs> <laughs> so it went on quite a bit. And, and then I'm like, you know what, forget it. Like, I, 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 I can't be ass anymore. I feel like, you know, that like I've, I've made a, enough noise. And, and lo and behold, a couple of months later, I cannot take credit for this. I cannot really take credit for this, but maybe there's something to do with it. A couple of months later, they came up with ridiculous guidelines for bringing your foldable bike on the train. I don't know if it's related to what I've done, but I, I think up to now, people still kind of attribute the fact that you can bring your bikes onto trains to me. So maybe, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, back then you're going to say something, right? You're going to yeah. write the newspapers. Yes. You know. That's the old school way. Yeah. Now people just post their opinions online. I just post opinions on Facebook and Twitter. Like, it used to be effort, you yeah. know? Go to write to the editor yeah. to get published. <laughs> yeah, in that vein, do you think that um, art or any art can invoke some substantial change? Or do you think art is kind of a, a use for the artist to kind of critique society in uh, a way? And there's no other practical implications of it. I think the danger of, making, of art making for every artist is this belief that you're doing something important. I mean, I'm not putting down art and artists, yeah. but, but, I, but what I'm saying is, I think we need to understand the limits of the medium, art itself. I, I would be highly delusional if I believed that my art would change anything. I mean, maybe it might, you know, change a person of two who's having a bad day, or who's, you know, like, who's having an epiphany that they who's already having an epiphany to begin with, and this is just it's reinforcing someone's belief in me. But I, I don't really believe in the power of art as an agent of change. I think it can be 
there, there, there can be a remote chance that it can be an agent of change, but I don't think it can be like, this will change the world. I, I used to live in this trinity of, of educate, advocate, and entertain. Then, then I, at some point, I kind of realized like, mm, you know, like, it's a bit too much to expect from art. No, I, I think as long as I can entertain the public, my audience, yes. I, I'm happy enough. Like, if I can amuse people with my works, um, if they can look at my work and like maybe snicker a bit, like, hey, you know, I'll be, I'll be quite happy. Um, and I think it's done its work if it does that. A lot of times now, I find myself making art purely for myself. Like, I, I make it because it is what I want to do. And of course, in doing that, I hope that the output would be of some benefit to the audience. And that yeah. benefit could really just be entertainment. Like, you can look at this piece and go like, hmm, that is quite nice. Yes. Besides the act of sort of documenting, which is what I'm trying to do with this series. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, if it's sort of pretty, if it's sort of like, you know, like kind of entertaining, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't ask so much. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being part of the, this online experience. And I hope that if anyone else has any questions, they can hopefully email you or, <laughs> or direct message Oham Gallery KL sure. on Instagram and we can forward it to Chitu. Cool. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay.